I'm Elmarie Ness, archaeologist and lecturer at the Viking Ship Museum in Oslo. With me today, I have Professor Jan Bill, the curator of the Viking Ship Collection, and he will tell us more about the most important symbol of the Viking Age, the Viking ships. And Jan, behind us, we have one of the most famous Viking ships in the world. What's really the big deal of the Viking ships? And why are they still preserved after more than a thousand years in the Earth? Well, the real deal uh, about the Viking ships, that is that they made the Viking Age possible. Without the Viking ships, there would not have been a Viking Age. It was the ships which were the vehicles on which they could travel out from Scandinavia, out in Europe, into Asia, plunder, establish colonies, uh, travel to unsettled lands in the North Atlantic and basically spread over a large part of the Northern Hemisphere. So the Viking ships were crucial as the means for making the Viking Age happen. Now behind me we have the most well-preserved Viking ship that exists today. It's the Oseberg ship and it was preserved because of the very, very special uh, circumstances under which it ended up in the ground. Because it did not sink out on the sea, what happened was actually that this ship was put into the ground as the burial ship for a very important or perhaps two important women in the year 834. And this burial took place in a valley filled with clay, so the clay which came to encapsulate the ship actually preserved it until this very day. So here behind me we have an almost 1200 year old ship just like it looked back then in the Viking Age. What we see is that the ship is fantastically decorated and not all Viking ships were decorated like this, uh, but many worse. These decorations tell us more about the ship than just its construction, because it tells us that this was a very, very important object for the Vikings. It was not just a means of transport, it encapsulated much of the ideas that they had about the world, life in the world, the life after death, and how the entire cosmos was constructed. Now if we are looking up into the very top of the stem of the ship, what we see up there is the head of a snake and a serpent-like body which actually goes down, transforms into the very body of the ship. So the entire ship takes the shape of a giant snake which is moving across the ocean. And this idea uh, is something that we find also in the mythology about the ships and their role in those times. Somehow, I think this might remind me of the myth of Beowulf. Are there any connection there? Oh yes, I think there is a connection to, uh, to Beowulf. Um, Beowulf is a poem uh, written down uh, the first time probably in the 8th century in Anglo-Saxon England, but with roots which are uh, much older, going back to Scandinavia from the centuries before. And in that poem, uh, there is a very important part for the understanding of these ship burials. What we read in Beowulf is that in the old times, a small baby washed up in a boat on the shores of the kingdom of Denmark. This child, was lying on a shield surrounded by wonderful weapons. Of course, the child and the weapons and everything 
was brought to the king in Denmark and he adopted the child and it grew up by him and became the next king of Denmark. And in that way, a new dynasty was established because this boy, of course, represented a new bloodline. Now, the interesting thing is that there is also a description of what happens when this King Shield, King Skjold, as he is called, uh, when he gets older and recognizes that death is coming to him because he orders his followers to put him on a ship when he's dead, surround him with weapons and grave gifts which are not to be uh, less beautiful, less fantastic than those which were, which were with him as he came. And then they are going to push out the ship into the sea. And that is what they do in the poem. And the ship sails away, driven by the currents, and disappears. And nobody knows where this ship is taking its cargo. From later writers, we know that this ship was, uh, this boat was in the beginning sent from the god of Odin, the mightiest of the gods in the Norse universe, with his son so that it was really a son of Odin who became the king of the Danes. And this fits into a pattern that we know from all over the Germanic area, where we see uh, that royal um, families, they establish foundation myth, which uh, makes them uh, the rightful heirs of kingdoms because they are ultimately the descendants of gods. We think that what we are looking at when we are looking at these beautiful ship graves that we have here in Norway, we are looking at the material uh, expression of that myth that in the burial of kings and queens, uh, you use this myth to solidify your rule. So you are basically reenacting the burial of King Skjold. Uh, but you're doing it not by pushing the ship out on the sea, uh, but by putting it into the ground and build a huge mound over it so that it will stand as a landmark and as a memorial over this particular person and over the uh, origins of that family. Nevertheless, this ship was a ship made for use in the real world. Do you think this ship could really have sailed to, let's say, Iceland? Well, this ship here behind me is not really the kind of ship that you would use to travel across the open uh, oceans. It is perhaps more a ship that was meant to be used in the waters between Denmark and Norway, along the Norwegian coast, into the Baltic. Uh, we also have to remember that at this time, you definitely were making journeys for plunder or for other purposes out into the North Sea and, um, and further away to Ireland. Uh, but Iceland was not yet on the map for the Scandinavians. But I can show you another ship which definitely was one that you could use to travel to Iceland with. And with that you could even have traveled to North America, you could travel down into the Mediterranean, you could have traveled uh, all over the globe, basically, although the Vikings didn't really do that. So this is one of the ships that could be used for traveling the oceans. This is the Gokstad ship, which was built about 80 years later than the Oseberg ship that we were just looking at. And in the meantime, a lot of developments had taken place in Scandinavian shipbuilding. So this ship is much better suited for crossing open waters. Probably that came along with a change also in the way the Vikings navigated, not relying so much on traveling along the coast and going more out on the open sea, crossing directly from 
Scandinavia to England, Scotland crossing directly further on to Iceland and ultimately to Greenland and North America. Other ships, probably also like this, took completely different directions and traveled down to the Mediterranean. Vikings even sailed on ships in the Caspian Sea, although we do not know if they actually brought ships there or if they built ships, just brought the knowledge of shipbuilding to the coast of the Caspian Sea. This ship is so impressive. It must have been an amazing sight at sea. But did the Vikings prefer to sail just with one ship or did they prefer to gather them into a fleet? Well, I think that amazing might be a word which fits well if you're seeing a Viking fleet coming back home. But if you are seeing a Viking fleet and yourself is an Anglo-Saxon, it's probably not amazing. It's probably more frightening because the Vikings were not really traveling just one ship alone, perhaps unless it was a cargo uh, vessel and traders on board. No, the Vikings preferred to travel in fleets. In the early Viking Age, these fleets were probably quite small, but later on they could, be, uh, they could consist of hundreds of, of ships. So maybe you should imagine 100, 200, 300 vessels like this approaching your beach, and then you would probably be very, very scared and with good reason. Now the ships here, the, the ships of the Vikings, were basically amphibious warships. They were extremely well suited for um, navigating coasts and rivers because they did not have a deep draft and they had lots of oars. Uh, they were not very heavy, uh, so it was easy to move them even over land if you needed to. Now that the Viking ships uh, had these qualities is probably a result of their history. Viking ships are descendants of a long boat building tradition which had been established in Scandinavia in centuries before the Viking Age. Now Scandinavia is an area where you cannot live without sailing. You have long coastlines. The areas where you can actually settle and live mostly lies along these coastlines and the interior is filled with mountains and forests which are hard to travel through. So there's a long, long tradition already in the Viking Age that if you traveled, you had to use boats. But on the other hand, Scandinavia was also outside the mainstream of European economic and technological development. So they didn't take in much of what happened in Europe in terms of developing sail until very, very late. Actually, not until the centuries directly before the Viking Age. So in Denmark and Norway and Sweden, what you had was a long, long tradition of building very, very light rowing boats. And then at some point in the 7th or 8th century, you started to put sail on these boats. And they were very light and became extremely efficient, quick. They became the Viking ship. If you look out in Europe at the same time, we have few finds from there. Uh, but what we do know is that you had for centuries been building sailing ships for cargo transport because it was the cargo which was important to travel on the waterways. Personal tra transport you could take over land. So it was two completely different traditions or two completely different reasons for building ships and the ships became very different. So perhaps that was what basically made the Viking ships superior to ships being built in other parts of Europe. They were specialized ships for quick communication, basically also for warfare. 
So what you are saying is that this ship could actually have been a warship? Oh yes indeed, this is a warship. So if this ship and all the Viking ship has been used as sailing ship and as a warship, who actually buried them in them afterwards? Well, we can go and, and meet one of them. Um, the man who was buried in this ship uh, is lying down here, or the remains of him at least. And since these graves are not illustrated uh, through written sources, but only from the archaeology. Of course, we do not know the name of anyone who was buried there, and we can't even really be sure of what kind of social role they had. But we do believe that they were the kings and queens of uh, that time. And here we have uh, the very few remains of the Gogstad man. Uh, he was perhaps around 50 years old when he died. He was a very big man um, compared to how people looked in the Viking Age. Uh, and he was very strongly built, big muscles. Um, we can see that he uh, must have had uh, good nutrition uh, as he grew up. He must have been training a lot. He even had what we um, today would call a tennis elbow, but which was perhaps in the Viking Age a sword elbow, elbow instead.